Hello, I'm Alice Hutchinson, the owner of Birds Books, an independent bookstore in Bethel, Connecticut, and I'm honored to be the host of Write America. The aim of this series is to help set the country back on a correct, productive course of freedom, justice, equality, and plain human kindness. Write America is a literary series created by author Roger Rosenblatt, featuring award-winning, nationally renowned authors, new and emerging writers, and readings and conversations each week about how books and art might bridge the deep divisions in our nation. Write America celebrates the quiet power of art in our lives, the unifying power of the highest uses of language. In novels, stories, essays, and poems, we recognize one another as parts of the human family, one family. Roger Rosenblatt, the creator of Write America, puts it this way, writing makes justice desirable, evil intelligible, grief endurable, and love possible. So welcome, and please join us every Monday evening at this time as many of the most beloved and distinguished writers in the country read from their works and talk to each other and with you in an effort to bring us together. If you missed last week's episode with Amy Hempel, Jim Shepard, and W. Todd Koneko, or any of the previous episodes of Write America, you can go to Birds Books Crowdcast channel and watch the recordings at any time. Tonight's episode is also being recorded, so if you miss something, you can go back and rewatch. Tonight, Birds Books hosts a reading by in conversation with Jennifer Chang, David Lynn, and Edward Zwick. I will return after the readings and the, their discussion to bring your questions and comments to the authors. For those of you unfamiliar with Crowdcast, you may have recognized the chat to the right of your screen. Feel free to comment as the evening progresses. At the bottom though, that's where you'll see the questions tab. That's where I will go to ask your questions of the authors. There is also a button at the bottom that takes you directly to our Crowdcast, to our website page for Write America so that you can see the full schedule. Now, a little about our first speaker. Jennifer Chang is the author of The History of Anomaly and Some Say the Lark, winner of the 2018 William Carlos Williams Award. Her poems have appeared and are forthcoming in The New Yorker, A Public Space, Poetry, Georgia Review, The Believer, The New York Times, The and Yale Review. And she has published essays on poetry and culture in the New Literary History, The Oxford Encyclopedia of Asian American Literature and Culture, The Volta, Blackwell's Companion to the Harlem Renaissance, The New England Review, and Los Angeles Review of Books. She serves as the poetry editor of the New England Review since 2003 and has been on the staff of Kundeman, a national nonprofit organization dedicated to nurturing generations of writers and readers of Asian American literature. She currently is an associate professor of English and creative writing at the University of Texas in Austin. Please welcome to the screen, Jennifer Chang. There you are. Hi. <laughs> Um, I'm going to read some poems. Uh, thank you, Alice and Roger and Lindsay for making this happen. And I look forward to talking to some of you later. Um, and mostly I'll read new poems from a manuscript in progress, but I'll, I'll, I'll jump in some older ones too. The Innocent. For weeks, we watched for hatchlings to come, of three smug eggs tucked into a nest, the nest tucked into the crook of a neighbor's honeysuckle. Time nodded, was nodding, the shred of living, how offhand the wind teeters toward erosion. Hard at work, on guard in two backyards, the robins mothered and fathered their territory daily. And beyond, our block's alley stretched aimless as fields were watching happens by accident, by nature. They'd squawk on a street lamp, a cedar fence, or a back stoop, warning off the tabby, my two young sons, everyone stuck at home. I lost my mind with watching and thought it grief or egotism, the bruise of yesterday, not least the sky unraveling another season. 
It was easy to mistake the bared skeletal pinions as lawn clippings, old leaves, that circle in the grass, a massacre of feathers, that terrible cat. It was easy to lose my mind. One neighbor said, let's not tell the children. Why know the world as always faded towards remnant? Another said, go, take the nest, set it under glass, and make it a lesson. Instead, I watched our habits pass, the honeysuckle fade from sickly sweet to nothing but heat. Call it science. It's summer again, and then everything's remnant. What did we do those days, stuck at home, my sons might someday ask. We lived or tolerated living. We looked away from death. So many of these poems will feature um, my children, and it's it's uh, I think it's a propos to this topic um, that we'll be talking around tonight about um, America and the future. Um, but it's also set very much in a kind of domestic world within a city. Um, so I'm going to read a poem from my second book, Some Say the Lark, and. It's set in the city I've just moved from to Austin, which is Washington, D.C., where we lived for eight years. Um, and the poem is called Inside Voice. Everyone is screaming inside is a thought I've held dear my whole life. I picture holes opening up inside and outside myself, the mouth of the earth opening, cloudless holes in the sky. Oh, that I cannot scream. My head empties, stomach gone, a soul lung vacating the body, the gulf of me newly voided. A child has a small voice, I tell my son, as our course teacher told me decades ago. And it is not true. He screams down every aisle of Petco, zebra finch, parakeet, angelfish, mollies. He's such a scream, parenting, such a scream. Use your inside voice, I calmly advise, calmly chasing him, calm as the books advise, calm being we want him to become, one of the very calm citizenry. I sing my ditty past buckets of litter, clumping and dust-free. Use it or lose it, as if his voice could simply drop to the floor, as if I'd snatch it from his throat. Use it or lose it, one says of resources natural and otherwise. My bargain with the planet, this corner of Petco, where the words, please don't hit me, sputter out of a girl's mouth to a man her father, or just a man, whose fists perch on the ledge of his belt, hawk-like, relentless, his voice swooping down to her, a dangerous pitch. I can only hear punctured consonants, a voice inside and yet too far outside. My eyes catch my son by the cats, each king to a plain plastic box, the calico pacing a brief perimeter, the golden tabby's muzzle learning my son's invading paw. Be gentle, I should say, but my voice makes a poor cage. There is the man and the girl. There is the store clerk, a teenage boy, pushing a cart of automatic feeders. There is the corn snake, the Dalmatian rat, the long-tailed lizard, past, present, and future selves. And yes, there are the cats, unwanted, wanting a sunspot all their own. What we know as home, the cats will colonize, stretch their gaze to stake territories, another arbitrary boundary. What we know as home is speculation, the other person who may or may not love you back, depending on the weather, whether the mortgage is paid, the softness of today's boiled egg. I want to scream. I want the girl to scream. Look away. 
the cats will not stop the screaming inside our heads. How do I protect them from my son's rough reach? His voice fills cages with bright admonishing, accusing the cats of what they can't help but be. Cat, cat, cat. I am the cat's. The cat is mine. His voice too loud to not stand as authority. Use it or lose it. I'm fuzzy on the antecedent now. His voice, my authority. The cat's the girl. It is Sunday, quarter to ten. In my bag, here's inventory. The blankie, the house keys, two stale knots of bread. Who am I? to call myself human. Mm. A conversation between women. My friend who lost her husband twice, first in death and then in betrayal, orders the Pinot Noir. Outside our window, lemon trees, the loss she does not speak of, unable to have children with a man like that, that she could love him into her wisdom, despite her wisdom. We call that love the despiteness, as if by being senseless, the heart becomes brave. I think of trees I had but did not want, the length of my marriages, what to do next summer. My other friend, who decided not to marry, explains why. We look at the sky because there is nowhere else to look. For hours, I will sip at my drink, hazarding clarity, such salt. A teacher once said, there is no place for because in poetry, because reasons are not poetic. I wrote no poems then, though I opened wounds every day. I want to be alone, I said to my first husband. I want to be alone, I would one day say to my next husband. Without an image, the teacher intoned, no one will believe there is pain. His wife hated him, I observed. She found no pleasure in any conversation. Oh, I wrote no poems then. The neighbors could hear our screaming, mistook it for television or the trees. Because I hated him, I think of him now. If only that were reason enough. This is a short one from my first book, The History of Anonymity. Pastoral. Something in the field is working away. Root noise, twig noise, plant of weak chlorophyll, no name for it. Something in the field has mastered distance by living too close to fences. Yellow fruit, has it pit or seeds, stalk of wither, Grass noise, fighting weed noise, dirt and chant. Something in the field, Coreopsis, I did not mean to say that. Yellow petal, has it wither gift? Has it gorgeous rash? Leaf lost and worried sprout, its bursting art. Something in the field, fallowed and cicada. I did not mean to say, has it roar and bloom? Has it rode and follow? A thistle prick, fraught burrs, such easy attachment, stem and stamen noise. Can I lime flower? Can I chamomile? Something in the field cannot. I'm going to read uh, one last poem, and it's it's a bit longer and it's fragmentary, um, so it, it's kind of episodic. You can kind of um, think of it as a kind of ambient experience so you don't have to listen. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I also wear another hat as, as an academic and I was asked a few years ago to write an essay about war and poetry. And I worked on it, I worked on it, and it just wasn't going anywhere. And I just never finished it, um, which, which happens. Um, 
And um, I guess the assignment lingered in my imagination because it, it instead of writing the essay, I ended up writing um, the poem of it, I guess. So, um, and I'll, I'll end with this one and then you can listen to David. An essay on war. As I do nearly every night, I will sweep the floor when my mother dies. I will miss her and not call her, and little will change, like the not calling. Every night I think of her and don't call because the thinking is soothing and the calling is not. I sweep the floor and think about what I've been asked to write, an essay on war. Most of us have not been to war, I begin, yet certain photographs make us remember what never happened to us. Either our imaginations are marked or no longer our own. Dust dwelling in corners deforms what I think of as an edge. There is the wall and there alongside it trails the dust, stubborn, unrelenting. There, a boy asleep on the beach, a girl turned into flame. In my mind, I am at war with images, my mother brazenly unsmiling in a photograph until the end of time. Her mouth's dark red, a terrible ellipsis, now awed by the body in time. She dons a smile, rinsed out like an absence. I hate poetry, I hate art. One broad sweep, and still the house will not be cleaned. My floors, my nighttime habits, I write without experience. Dying is a fact few of us can bear. My mother is dying and we pretend nothing will happen. There is the onslaught, tiny particles of my children proliferate. Our breakfast crumbs, my grief, the nothing that scatters across the room that won't be swept away. I try to not burn the toast. I try to not bend to abstraction. This page torn out of nothing. What did you pluck out of the tree? What did you put in your mouth? My mother who is dying tells me to lock the doors and windows. Winter is coming. Every house is a target. I live in a house with a writing desk. As a child, H's mother, barely escaping the war, left everything behind, a well-stocked kitchen, the first books she read in English. She held on to her small self, her only baggage, covetously, terrified in the back seat of a stranger's car, barreling toward a border. Now, in America, my mother is dying. She is scared of deer, snakes, caterpillars, rats, and some men, and windows and doors. I no longer know where she puts the broom, if she sweeps the house or answers the phone. Who made this mess? I write, the mother of all wars is inside ourselves. I cannot decide whether to speak or stay silent, or I speak only ineffectual words, the crackling sounds that trees make on a windy night. The season changes. Again, nothing is coming out of my mouth. I read a poem about a family photograph, the son long gone, the mother years into a second language, second life. Her hair is a black wave in a black ocean. I write, why do we not think of this as an image of war. The daughters look nothing alike. I'm leaving the door open, the windows unlatched. I sweep the floor as my children sleep. I sweep out the leaves they've carried into the house, every corner, the dust, the dust, the dust. My mother was born in a war, outlasted wars I studied and wars I never heard of, never saw my whole life. Thank you. Jennifer, thank you very much. Our next speaker this evening is David Lynn. 
Very recently, the 2021 Kenyan Review Award for Literary Achievement was given to Ken was given to Kenyan Review editor emeritus David H. Lynn for, and I quote, a gifted writer and extraordinary editor who has long been a vital force for American letters, largely through the journal he led from 1994 to 2020. He received a 2016 O. Henry Award for the short story Divergence, the first story in Children of God New and Selected Stories. He is the author of four books and Glimmer Train, which won the Short Story Prize in 2015, was the Frank O'Connor International Short Story Award finalist and the Ohio Anna Library Association Award for Editorial Excellence. His stories and essays have appeared in magazines and journals in America, England, India, and Australia. Please welcome to the screen, David Lynn. Let me snag you here, David. There you go. Thanks. Thank you, Ellis. Thanks for having me this evening. It's an honor uh, to be appearing uh, with Jennifer. That's so much fun, such an honor, and those poems were so beautiful. Uh, and I'm grateful to uh, the man uh, who's all our friend, Roger Rosenblatt, uh, a man of generosity and vision and love. Uh, uh, and uh, best of all, he's married to someone even better, uh, Ginny Rosenblatt, who's uh, quite remarkable as well. Uh, and he's the force uh, behind all of this, so uh, I'm, I'm honored to be included. Uh, I'm going to read uh, uh, just a, a couple of short selections from the short story Divergence uh, to share with you this evening, and then I look forward to the conversation that will, that will follow. Divergence. Just as he was swinging his leg over the bike, Shivani brushed past and whacked him on the rump. Watch yourself she cried. Jeremy Mathis bobbed up and onto his saddle. He'd caught his wife in a few strokes, swishing past her on the street, and already he was marveling at the lightness of the new frame, the smooth response of derailleur and gears. At the first corner, they cruised, slowing for a glance each way. Again, he pushed ahead, wobbling lightly. The balance was entirely different from his ancient touring bike. This would take some getting used to, and not just the new bicycle. He was entirely prepared to sacrifice the summer to countless adjustments, now that his book had finally appeared in the spring, and, not coincidentally, the trustees of Ransom College had just this past weekend confirmed his tenure in the classics department. For months, he'd been predicting that promotion would alter nothing, that he wouldn't feel in any way transformed once it had been granted, Yet already in the stretch of a few days, he discovered how faulty that reasoning had been. It seemed that over the course of many years, a tightly woven mesh of stress and anxiety had gradually and ever more tightly caged his heart, his lungs. Mostly he'd been unaware of the binding, except for the occasional snapping awake at four in the morning, sucking for air. Over these last few days, that invisible harness had finally begun to loosen, to fade, shadow becoming shadow becoming light. Each time his lungs filled with air seemed almost a revelation, perhaps the start of a new life. A decade and more earlier, he'd steal an hour on hard-packed country roads in Virginia, digging with his old 10-speed to grind away the frustrations, dead ends, and humiliations that are the dues paid in grad school. And just such a bicycle as the one he was riding had been his dream, an expensive dream he'd scarcely ever acknowledged aloud. Two days ago, however, he'd arrived to meet Shivani for a celebratory dinner at their favorite restaurant, a trattoria on High Street. She'd spotted him through the large front window and was standing in her black dress and pearls by their special table with one hand on the blue and silver Italian bike a bright bow on its seat. Not until today had there been a real chance to get out on the road. They spun down to Maine and sliced along an alley to the back entrance of a coffee shop where their small group of friends were already gathered. Marty, Gretchen, and Lee were standing there, standing with their own bikes. As Jeremy swung onto the sidewalk, Owen Thurlow emerged from the shop with a cup of coffee. Nice wheels, he said saluting the new bike. I must be paying you too much. 
since when are you paying him at all? Shivani demanded. I thought he was teaching just for the love of it. Anyway, this baby comes out of my check from the attorney general. The provost saluted her in turn. Everyone other than Owen was satisfied with water bottles and eager to be away. So soon they were mounted again and cutting, cutting over to the Alum Creek path. The day was gray an occasional faint drizzle keeping them cool, but slicking the pavement. It took less than five miles of occasional weaving and dodging before they'd left the city behind, along with its joggers, baby strollers, and dog walkers. They were flying now across the rolling, open country of central Ohio, the river meandering near and away again from the old rail path. Hey, fancy pants, quit showing off, Owen grunted loudly. Jeremy swiveled and tossed him a wave. The machine he was riding yielded such a pure joy that, without quite realizing it, he'd been out front and pressing his friends beyond their usual pace. He eased, coasting so that Gretchen could swing into the lead. As he drifted back to her side, Shivani was breathing hard, but wouldn't grant him the satisfaction of admitting it. She was also smiling broadly. So, she said. Yeah, he said. Nice. He was feeling strong and swift. He'd remember that afterward. The rhythm of the ride, the enti entire day was perfect. There was satisfaction even in the way his sweat was wicking efficiently into the breeze, except for this one annoying patch high on his brow, just under the lip of his helmet. He flicked at it with a finger, and in that instant spied the groundhog ambling out of tall grasses along the river. This, too, he recalled later, how it raised its snout, spotting them in turn. Maybe Jeremy caught up in his own momentum, rhythm, surprise. He hesitated. Had he started to call out? The muscles in his throat tightened later when he recalled the instant. For its part, the animal froze as well, considered. Then, with astonishing quickness, hurdled its bulk of rolling muscle and fat across the path. Dodging Gretchen, it rammed heavily into Shivani's spokes. His eyes were already open. This he realized. But only gradually would they tighten toward focus, and only partly. The pounding pulse in his head throbbed more painfully as his vision cleared. But someone was just then sticking a finger in his eye pushing one lid up and the other, and he was figuring she was a doctor. Who else would poke, with, poke him with such casual deliberateness? And so this was a hospital, and he was in a hospital. Okay. When he woke again, he remembered the hospital right off. His own lack of surprise, of curiosity, surprised him. The dimmed light in the room seemed to thrum at the same rate as the thud of pain in his head. A woman was hovering between him and the light, looking for something in his face, studying him. Was this the doctor again? He started to ask, and then, the effort too exhausting, fell back and far away. The woman glanced to the side, and then someone else, Shivani, was hovering too, closer. He felt her kiss on his lips. Hey, she said softly, and held a straw to his mouth. Water was good. He sucked after more. What the fuck, he tried to whisper, water dribbling down his chin. Next time, or maybe the time after, that's when he began to realize something was wrong, or at least different, though he couldn't put his finger on it, couldn't put a name to it. Shivani had been speaking for a while. He realized this, too, but his attention was drifting. He tried hard to appear attentive. Do you remember, she asked. She was asking him. Not sure, he mumbled. He was proud of that answer. It didn't give him away. You saw it just before, right? The groundhog? The groundhog he did remember. Sure, he said. I didn't. That's the thing. I felt Gretchen swerve and the thump as it hit my front wheel, and then I was pitching over. Darling, brave, Jeremy, you tried to catch me. So we were both going down. Owen and Lee ran right into us and down into the mangle. What a mess. She sighed, and he could tell that she was struggling not to cry. 
He didn't know what to say. He remembered the groundhog. Your helmet split on the pavement, just like it's supposed to, but you were knocked cold anyway. The rest of us were nothing but cuts and scrapes. Shivani was struggling with her own helplessness. He closed his eyes. Her voice, its elite Deliwala cadence, more British than the Queen, was scraping, grating, annoying. It had never bothered him before. He knew that. But all this emotion, the concern and guilt, was radiating from her too, demanding a response in kind. Was he supposed to provide sympathy? A quick surge of anger shivered him. His head was throbbing harder. The flame of his little rage expired almost instantly, leaving him frail, a spent wick on the hospital bed. He could not move. Jeremy groaned. Shivani stroked her cool hand across his forehead. She had been at his bedside when he woke. He remembered this too, and he'd recognized her right off. Her eyes tired, the stylish flare of her short hair unusually must in the non-time of the hospital. He'd known who she was. He'd been glad to see her, truly, to sip the cool water through a straw, grateful not to be alone in this strange place. But now, as he considered, and he was panting lightly through his mouth, he realized that even in that first moment, awake, he'd also felt, what? Different, distanced, dislocated, watching this lovely woman from very far away, his wife, hugging a silk shawl against the arid chill, someone he knew so very well. And yet it seemed as though a tether between them had snapped like a tendon torn at bone hinge. A question occurred to him, and he opened his eyes once more. How long? he whispered. She hesitated, searching his face. You've been here two weeks. That stopped him. It took a while to make sense. Two weeks? I was out for two weeks? Shivani nodded, and now she was looking sad and worried and guilty again and relieved all at once, tears in her eyes. He turned his head. He figured the groundhog must have got away free and clear. Thanks very much. Thank you, David. We're trying to get Ed on. He's having some technical problems. So let me minimize you for a second while I see what's going on. Um, it may be that we bring the two of you back on to talk. And then if Ed can get on, oh, here he is. Let me just invite him directly to the screen. Meanwhile, while we're waiting for him to get directly onto the screen, I'm going to read his introduction. Our next speaker is Edward Zwick. He is an American filmmaker and producer of film and television. He has worked primarily in the comedy, drama, and epic historical film genres, including About Last Night, Glory, Legends of the Fall, and The Last Samurai. He is also the co-creator of the television series 30-something and Once and Again. Zwick's body of work has earned numerous accolades, including an Academy Award and BAFTA Award for Best Picture as a Producer, and a Primetime Emmy Awards for Outstanding Drama Series, Outstanding Writing in a Limited Series, and Outstanding Dram Dramatic Special. He has additionally been nominated for multiple Golden Globes. Let's see if we can get Ed onto the screen. I see him here, and I'm inviting you onto the screen. Ed, you need to just accept the invitation. Let's see if it works. So what I think I will do while I'm trying to get Ed onto the screen is I will invite back David and Jennifer for discussion. And if Ed pops up, then we'll just take it from there. Sound fair enough? We'll give it a shot. There you are, David. And there you are, Jennifer. And if we can get Ed back up on the screen, then we'll give him a chance to read and then we'll go from there. But this is what we got. Well, let me take this moment to say to Jennifer how much I loved your poems and the, the poem about your mother 
and the dust and the the breakdown of the, the family order while you're dealing with all that that was really stunning i loved it no oh, thank you so much david that that means a lot coming from you <laughs> I've had to read a lot of poems in my time, and that was just to, just to hear you read was such a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you. Um, wh what do you think we should talk about? Oh, I don't know. The last time I saw Roger a few weeks ago, uh, he went off on politics um, a, a, a bit, and then he did this really amazing swerve to talk about love and the generosity uh and uh and and uh gen uh, the, the generation of art uh and i i thought that was really moving and really right and, and i think that um there is something to be said for uh having these readings and and posing art as a as a kind of remedy to the to the world we live in what do you think um i i think it'd be worth thinking about it too in light of the pandemic and what what we writers and artists have been doing and how art both sustains us through difficulty to ask the questions that are troubling us. Um, but also I find sometimes um, frustrated with, with art, frustrated with writing, um, the, the limitations of it. And I think, um, I think some of um, that poem you referenced um, alludes to that. Uh, there's a moment where the speaker uh, announces, I hate, I think it's, I hate poetry, I hate art. Um, and it felt terrible to, to, to write when I was working on yeah, that. Yeah, but you know, I, what, so what I love about what we do is precisely those moments where it brings us poetry and fiction and nonfiction, you know, literature over and over again brings us to the edge of where language doesn't suffice mm. you know it br brings us to a kind of silence uh which is what you're you're, you're talking about in, the, in that poem and i really love that where uh we're, we're you know you and i are people of language and, and i try and put everything into into language and they're sometimes the most important stuff um can't handle it yeah I think that's true. I think that, I mean, I'm also really curious about um, your work as an editor and, uh, you know, all, all that you're able to do, I, I admire so much because I think that one of the things that really, um, when I feel frustrated with my writing practice, I'm so grateful for the opportunity to, to read other people and to publish other people and to create a space for a conversation where I feel overwhelmed by silence um, because I, I think we can lead on silence and say like there's a silence in human experience that um, stands in for what we cannot articulate, the pain, um, the yeah. suffering, um, the inexplicability of war and violence. Um, but then, you know, we're making poems and stories, but um, a magazine makes for instance, for instance, a magazine makes a community, it makes a conversation, which feels a little more, uh, I don't know, maybe I'm in a dark frame of mind today. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I feel like uh, the community you're talking about is, is really precious. And um, I, I have said a lot often that we're living in a kind of golden moment, uh, a golden period where uh, because of the internet, because of, of, of the ways we reach, up, reach each other, because of all the the writing programs and faculties that are out here, um, there's a kind of ongoing conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, the downside of that is that for editors like me or like who, who I used to be, there's this uh, overwhelming flow of uh, submissions that's almost impossible to manage. And I, I, I really think that's going to be a challenge for editors in, in the future. But the good side of it is that we're all in it together. And that's a way of facing down the silence and facing down the darkness is knowing that we're in this together. And certainly I feel that way um, with my students, especially at this time of the year when, they, when they've been struggling, when we've had a long semester together, when we're all tired, but they're also writing some pretty damn great stuff. And that's, for me, that still feels pretty great. Do you miss doing editorial work? Not a minute. <laughs> 
not a minute. I got my start. I'm not, I, I, it, I confess it's so long ago, back in the, in the late 1970s. And I, I uh, was in grad school at UVA. And I remember going into uh, the offices of Stage Blackford. There's a name for you, Stage Blackford. It was the longtime editor names. of VQR. And he dumped this pile of uh, f- fiction submissions in my arms and said, here, go read these. And, um, you know, that's such a vanished time of paper manuscripts and uh, Stage Blackford leaning back with a toothpick in his mouth and... Um, uh, and I spent a lot of a lot of years doing it, so I'm I'm more than happy for others, for Nicole Teres Dutton and others, to uh, take up that baton. Yeah, and she's doing great work. I, you know, we we both went to UVA, you and I. I knew there was some connection, <laughs> but I wasn't sure that was it. Yeah, who did you work oh, with there, Rita? I worked with Rita and Charles, um, but I also oh. I read poems for. VQR, Virginia Quarterly Review, and had my first uh, editorial gig as poetry editor of Meridian. Um, oh, wow. So I know the name Stage Blackford, and I, I, I know those offices that you're thinking, or at least I know those piles of paper that we get. And there yeah. was something wonderful about opening the envelopes and feeling that yeah. that kind of human contact. You're right. It's so different now where everything is, is the internet, and there's so many submissions. Um, but there's still that work of... of um, even if we can't actually have the tactile feel of opening an envelope, there is that kind of, I, I feel the presence of another person. And that's the thing that you don't always get as a writer um, alone in your world. And and I think about what it feels like to send poems out now and, and the, the, to the void of the internet. Um, so when I receive the work, um, there is a part of me that, 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 um, feels the, that memory it's like a muscle memory like oh yeah where some an encounter is happening um right. between the between me and the submission and the right i remember for, people are always saying what are you looking for and I, I i say i'm like the supreme court justice i know it when i see it um but yeah. you, you know there's always the eureka moment that an editor is looking for and especially as you say uh it was so much more intense when it was on paper so mm-hmm. I remember sitting on a Sunday afternoon in my office, just being brain dead and wanting to go home and be with my family, family and have a drink or something. And I have this, you know, pile of yellow manila envelopes and I'm going through them one by one and feeling like I have lost all discrimination, all judgment. I'm just going through the motions. I'm totally brain dead. And then I pull out the story by uh, a, a young writer, uh, Thomas Glaive. Um, I've ne- I'd never heard of Thomas Glay then. Uh, he was a young guy from Brooklyn, originally from Jamaica, extraordinary. And I'd never heard of him, anything. Like that. And I, I was going through the motions, and this, this story just knocked me out of the chair. You know, it was that great eureka moment that, that every editor uh, uh, yearns for. It's why we do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was such a lovely moment. And it still happens every now and then. I, I had a similar experience where I was also now. Now what happens is I have to go to the other room, put on earplugs so I don't hear my family, and I sit in front of the screen for hours. And oh God, yeah. it, it's very deadening. But a, a poet from Botswana named Tawanda Mlalu popped up, and I just couldn't believe. You had that feeling where, on the one hand, you think, "How could this possibly be a poem? I've never seen or heard anything like it." And then the other thing is, this is exactly what a poem should be because it woke me up. Um, right. it, it startled me into feeling my body again. Um, and it was a very, you know, it, there were simple poems, very, very um, straightforward. And they'll be coming out in new issues r- soon, but of, of New England Review. But um, I, I wonder, you know, what we can think about, how we could take that feeling of excitement and being stirred back into the body to, to some of the things we're trying to talk about, which is like, when, when is art, can art be generative of a better life or a better world? Um, can the dreams of poems become reality? Well, that's, that's <laughs> the big question, isn't it? You know? yeah. Um, yeah. That's why we all do this. But I love, I love that sense of the connection with the body because that's, that's really where it hits you. You know, um, you teach at a university, I teach at a small college. And one of the things I say all the time is that the thing that separates um, the, all the arts, not just literature, but all the arts from the other academic pursuits 
uh, at the at the college or at the university. Um, all you know, whether it's psychology or uh, anthropology or physics or whatever, um, it's all intellectual, and, and that's a wonderful and noble endeavor. And studying literature or writing or writing literature um, is also intellectual, but it also contains emotion. If the arts don't uh, don't grab you in the body, as you were saying, if, if it doesn't involve emotion, they're not going to work. Uh, yeah. and, and that's a big thing I try and get across to my students. It's, it's really ultimately all about feeling. Have you felt that, um, have you felt challenged? I mean, it's just a turn to the, the crisis in the humanities. Have you felt challenged by that endeavor? The education of the senses? <laughs> You know, um, that's one way that I'm really, really, really spoiled. Um, Kenyon, we still have the largest, the English department is the largest department in the college. Oh, that's uh, and, incredible. And, uh, students come to Kenyon because they want to read and they want to write. And uh, and, and I, so I'm not, uh, in my job here, I'm not having to fight that battle. But I do nationally, certainly as editor, I did as, mm -hmm. as much as I could a voice for the, the humanities. Because uh, I, I do think we're under siege. Yeah, I, I actually left a job in part because I felt I was constantly defending my existence as as a writer and as a as someone who works in literature. Um, wow. I couldn't demonstrate the numbers, but there were always questions of numbers: Are there enough students? Are your students doing well after college? And like, things that you can't measure were completely ignored, like feeling and imagination and you know, critical thinking. Well, I do get parents mad at me all the time. Because, <laughs> uh, and, and I delight in it because, you know, they, they, they want to know what kind of job is my kid going to get immediately out of um, uh, college. And I say, I don't care. I couldn't care less. I don't want them to get a real job. I don't want them to go to grad school. God forbid they should get an MFA. They have nothing to write about. They need some life experience. Um, and I think what a, a liberal arts uh, program does is prepare you uh, to figure out what you need as a human being. And that takes a few years and it takes mm -hmm. some life experience, but parents don't really want to hear that. I have to say though, and I'd be interested in, in your take on this. Um, my students right now are really anxious. I think the whole pandemic and the uncertainty about the future has even my most talented and strong and independent students. They're just terrified about going out into the world. I, I haven't seen it this way before. Yeah, I, I've seen it. Um, I've seen it a lot, and both of my students, where I used to teach at George Washington University, and even in my MFA students, this sense of um, this pervasive sense of anxiety, um, and and I don't, I don't know how to to fix it. I, I think one thing is that they are facing a really difficult world. Um, I remember at one point during the pandemic saying. Um, I felt very lucky to be old, to older, to, to be old enough where I had a job and I had I had some direction and you know I had made the decisions in my life to have the life that I have and I couldn't imagine having to be at that point where, well now I have to go through experience to make decisions and I now I have to, like it feels what I feel is a terror at making mistakes, um, terror of a future. Um, and I think they're related. The fear of making a mistake is that you'll you won't be able to fix it and go back or start afresh. Like there aren't like there aren't enough opportunities. Um, That's true. On the other hand, I, I think what you just touched on is the great burden that we should all confront and embrace, which is that the for me the 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 biggest subject for literature going forward is the planet, um, yeah. you know, and, and, and it's bigger than politics and it's, and it's bigger than, uh, than any of us. But I think that what we as, as writers need to be addressing more forcefully, uh, it, it, you know, is the, the, what we're leaving our children and it's a mess. Yeah. Um, and I think so. One of the things I'm involved with here is a new program in science and nature writing. Um, so that, um, talented artists are um, learning about and engaging um, science and nature in a, in a meaningful way so they can write about it and communicate it to general readers, uh, not just specialists. 
Mm. Has it affected your own writing? This, oh, yeah. this turn to the planet imagination? Definitely. Hmm. Yeah, there's a there's a question here actually from Nell Painter about trees. Um, she writes, Jennifer Chang, I heard trees in your poems as homes for birds, icons of time and reason, season, and most telling for me as symbols of disruption, war, and imagine, Im immigration. Are trees as crucial to you as I thought um, after hearing these poems? Yes. <laughs> um, well, you know, um, trying to figure out how to, to link this to what you're talking about with the need to write about the planet. Um, I think one thing that that question observes is that there, you know, we one of the responsibilities now in writing about the planet is not to simply make pretty images. That nature isn't an ornament in our writing. Um, right but something like a tree can be emblematic of um, not just home and peace, but also um, terrible violences that we inflict upon other people. I think also about, um, I recently moved to Texas and I'm very struck by how different the trees are here. And recently I noticed a really beautiful tree everywhere. It's it's one of the few trees that changes to a full red Um most of the trees turn yellow. And I discovered it's an invasive species. It's called the Chinese tallow tree and is the most dangerous tree to Texas. Um, wow. And so there's like a whole hit. So I said, so, so I, this is, so there's a whole history to how the tree got here, um, how we respond to it as a beautiful object, but then also as a threat to our yard. Um, that fact that it's 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 called the Chinese tallow and it originates from China and the emphasis on that and its name um, has also been sort of interesting. But I, I I haven't I've just started doing the research on that. But but it was one of those instances where um, beauty turned out to be false or beauty turned out to be a disguise for something else. Isn't that interesting? I really like that that that, that, that beauty is a disguise or, or misleading or dangerous. Yeah. I really like that. What, who are you reading right now who, who you find fascinating? You just stole my question. <laughs> sorry about that. I'm sorry. I just want to take just a quick second to say that Ed has been trying to get on the entire evening and there's some technological problem that has kept him from joining us. And, and I do regret that, but I know that he is such a good friend of Roger's and that we will try and slot him in in a schedule at some point. So um, I just well, have loved your conversation. Tell him he owes me big time. Pardon me? <laughs> tell him he owes me big time. You, you've just told him. <laughs> um, I, I do want to ask what you're reading. That was my question that, that you knew was coming at you, but I've got a couple others. Well, what do you think, Jennifer? What, what have you been reading? What are you reading right now? I've been I'm reading... a bookstore owner. I can't help yeah. it. <laughs> well, I actually haven't been reading poetry. I've been I've been reading um, Evan Osnos's The Wild Wildland, uh, The Making of America's Fury, and it's not entirely off topic because it does um, it looks at three communities in West Virginia, Connecticut, and um, Chicago. And one of the recurring themes is the ways that these different communities have treated the environment um, and how it's not as simple as destroying the environment or being reckless, but there are all these kind of external forces um, having to do with capitalism and power and also um, misleading people um, through political messaging. So I really recommend really absorbing. the name? Could repeat the name of the, the book? Uh, the book is uh, Wildland, colon, The Making of America's Fury. Thank you. David, what are you reading right now? Well, you know, I, last year, it, it, it's not often that I'm totally knocked off my feet by uh, an author or, or a book. Um, and I, I belatedly discovered Molly O'Farrell uh, when she won the Booker Prize with Hamnet. 
Um, and and I, I read Hamnet. Uh, Maggie O'Farrell. Before. Maggie O'Farrell. Um, and um, I just, I thought it was incredible. In fact, yes. um, as an editor and a teacher, all the way through, I kept thinking, she can't end this right. It can't possibly end right. She's going to blow it. I know I've seen this happen too many times. We have a great story, uh, and, uh, and, and it's, just, it's just not going to work. And, she, and the ending is absolutely perfect. She lands it like uh, an equestrian. It's just amazing. And so I went and read a couple more of her books, which, again, I don't usually do. But she is an astonishing talent. So I, I, I recommend her to, to anyone. Our book group just did that book, and uh, you may be interested to know she just came out with a children's book. Mm. Oh, wow. It's, it just came out within the last month. I mean, just came out with a children's picture book. So it's very interesting that you would uh, mention that author. Um, what book have you read? And this is not homework, so if you don't want to answer it, it's fine. What book have you read that you wish you had written? <laughs> That's actually a really hard question. Did you I'm think sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I said it's not homework. You don't have to answer it. Well, well I, I'd leap in there and, and, and say uh, uh, one of the um, writers I, I most admire is George Saunders. Uh, he's a wonderful uh, um, short story writer principally, but then he came out with Lincoln and the Bardo last year, which I loved. I just loved. But he has a new book based on his teaching called It's Something Like... Um, a swim Rather in the rushing. rain. Yeah, I'm yeah. looking at it, but I can't read it from here. And yeah. uh, it, it, I just loved it, and, and because it, it does a lot of what I do when I'm teaching uh, fiction and fiction writing, and it's a it's a beautiful, beautiful book. It's like swim in the pond in the rain or something like that. But yes, yeah. purple cover. I would second that recommendation too. It it's such a generous. I mean, I, it's hard to imagine a more generous writer than George Saunders, but then that he would share his lesson plans. And essentially, right. um, and and kind of lead you through how he reads and how he talks to his students. Um, and it's about the Russians, the Russian writers. Right. Great Russian short story writers. Yeah, it's fabulous. Yeah. Have, have either of you had the privilege to go on any literary pilgrimages, either doing research or just getting intel or background or any of that? Yeah, I have a, a couple. I. I um, I really wanted, this was very spur of the moment. This was many years ago, decades ago. I think I was just out of college and I had access to a car. I was in New York and decided I wanted to see Emily Dickinson's house. Uh, and I drove there and the house was closed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I haven't been back since, but I, I remember prowling around and trying to figure out if I could look in the windows. Um, but a, a really memorable experience I had was in the archives at Yale, at the Beinecke, uh, reading the letters of Claude McKay. And it was my first real experience in an archive, um, or at least one where I tried to read everything. And it was like reliving his life and his death over and over again, going through the different correspondence and reading through all the letters and then you know, going through all the years and going back to the beginning and going through the years with each, it, it was one of the most um, heartbreaking, but also visceral engagements I'd had with a writer. Like it felt so, and it's this amazing um, Jamaican poet, Claude McKay, who came here to turn yeah. on the country. Uh, so it was, it was wonderful to kind of travel with him um, through his relationships and through the world. Dave. Yeah, there's just one. Yeah, there's one crazy story where he kept trying to get someone to get him a copy of Ulysses, and no one would give him one. And it was oh, like, no. three or four different friends. <laughs> well, on a number of occasions over the years, I've led a group of uh, Kenyan uh, students in a program abroad in in Exeter, England, mm -hmm. uh, and it's a it's a wonderful program. In fact, I'm doing it again uh, next year, the academic uh, year 22-23, and part of that program is going to places across the United Kingdom and, and into Ireland and reading um, literature that is very local. Uh, great literature, it could be Thomas Hardy, it could be Jane Austen, uh, it could be Shakespeare, uh, but trying to connect it to, um, or Maggie O'Farrell for that matter, uh, uh, 
really connecting it to a place and uh, the students really love that and and I love it too. That sounds great. Can I come? Yeah, me Please. too. I'm, I'm on board. Um, what advice would you give to a writer working on their first book? <laughs> Be patient. Oh, that's exactly, that's exactly what I was going to say. Be patient and do it for the writing. Don't do it to be published. Don't do it for fame and fortune because mm. you'll, uh, you, you know, you'll go crazy. Yeah, uh, I would, the, I would absolutely. The reason to be a, the reason to write is to, is to do the writing. There's a, a young poet named Yin Yi, and in a recent essay he, he writes, he asked this question uh, of young writers, are you writing for a career or are you writing for the art? And it's a paraphrase of what he asked, but I, I, I think making that distinction that, that you just made, like write for the right reasons, take your time with it. Well, have either of you read an emerging author that you think we should know about? Uh, I just mentioned Yin Yi. I so. was just going to say you did, but David, well, <laughs> open it. If, my, if, my, my life has been doing that for so many, so many years, and now, of course, I, I'm, I'm going blank. Um, <laughs> but that's what I spent my life doing. But that is that is the best thing of all is 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 that moment where you're discovering someone um, uh, who you want to recommend to the world, or you want to bring to the world. That's that's pretty wonderful. Actually, I will. I'll, I'll tell you. One of my former students who now teaches uh, uh, in Michigan um, is uh, Caitlin Horrocks. And uh, she came out with a novel last year called The Vexations. And, oh, yeah. Uh, it's, and it's a fictionalized, fictionalized version of uh, bi biography of Eric Satie, um, mm -hmm. the French composer and pianist. And it's beautiful. It's a brilliant, brilliant book. I was blown away. <laughs> Do either of you have a favorite author? All of them. Yeah, that that's that's a terrible question, but I always ask it. I am also very inclusive, like David. <laughs> well, is there anything else you want to share with us that we haven't talked about already? Anything about? I just meant in terms of books that you're reading, things that we should have that we might have missed. Um, Genre, I'm finding a lot of people are reading the classics again. That's that's always very surprising to me. Um, but you're dealing with students, and I'm not. I'm dealing well, with general public. It's just a whole different I, viewpoint. Yeah, I would also say, um, I mean, read the Kenyan Review. I That was one of my first journals, um, and it's a real... It's it's a real education and a real tour of the world as an imaginative space. Um, and it never, it never fails to impress me. Um, you know, when David was editor, I went Nicole, now that Nicole's not editor, I think it's wonderful to follow um, how I, I just, it, you know, I just love that journal. I'm glad to hear it. I think Nicole is really exciting and doing very different things, uh, as as she should, um, from me. And I have no uh, possessiveness as far as that goes. I want her to strike out for the territories and do uh, exciting and brave uh, discovery of new work. Well, thank you both for a wonderful evening. I'm going to go ahead and sign you off now. And I hate doing that because I've really enjoyed your discussion. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to Jennifer and David, and we're looking forward to rescheduling Ed for another time. And I thank you both for participating in Write America this evening. To everyone who tuned in tonight, and thank you particularly to Roger Rosenblatt for creating such a special series for us to look forward to each Monday evening. We hope you all. We hope to see you all next Monday for readings from Juan Felipe Pereira and David Tomas Martinez. Please remember Bird's Books has the author's books here at the store in case you would like any. And uh, thank you all for joining us. It's been a real pleasure. Good night.